Well, good evening. Uh, welcome to EdChat Interactive. My name is Mitch Weisberg, and tonight we're going to be talking about the 20% uh, time, which is uh, which comes from Google. I, I guess uh, Kevin will explain uh, about 20% time better, better than I can. Uh, but to me, 20% time is is really a key for how we're going to move our students and transition them in, into the real world and prepare them for careers and and in college as well. Uh, Kevin's the author of the 20 Time Project and and other books. Uh, let me first take a few minutes and just describe EdChat Interactive. So uh, we started EdChat Interactive about three years about three years ago. Our purpose was to come up with a format, a live format that was much more interactive and much more aligned with adult learning than a typical webinar. And we felt that in order to do that, we had to get the audience to interact, the people tending to interact, um, and to learn socially in addition to just listening to whoever was talking. So we'd like to really, people who are here tonight, to interact with each other, to reflect, and to participate. And let me explain how to do that. The first thing is that you'll see underneath your avatar, there's a raise hand button and an ask button. Uh, there's going to be times during the session where Kevin's going to say, can we have somebody come up on stage uh, and uh, talk to me about this particular issue? Like, for example, you may be concerned about elementary school uh, projects. So you may, you may say, can, you know, if somebody's concerned about elementary school projects, can we talk about what you're doing in your school? In which case, you would click on the raise hand button. I would find you, and I could bring you up, and you could have a discussion with Kevin. Uh, the second button underneath your avatar is the ask button. Uh, the ask button is the way that you ask a question. Um, and you click on the ask, ask button, uh, you get a dialog box. Then in that you type the, your question into the dialog box, you submit it, I see the question, and then I pass it on to Kevin. So those are the first two ways of interacting. Uh, the third way of interacting is through what I call a back channel or IMing. Uh, you probably saw this when you first logged on to the, the Shindig platform. Uh, but when you move your cursor over your avatar, you get a five item menu. And one of those uh, one of those items is called IM. If you click on that, that opens up another dialog box, which allows you to talk to the other participants here tonight. So and I'd like to I'd like to to encourage you to do that now is to open up up that dialog box, click on that I am button, and um, why don't you type into that box one thing that you'd like to learn tonight. I know that a lot of you did that on the spreadsheet, and Kevin and I have talked about some of your questions on the spreadsheet, but maybe things have changed since then. And so in that dialog box, type in something that you'd like to learn to tonight. And if you see something that somebody else has typed in that you can help them with, feel free to type in and help them. Now, I will say, of all the people here tonight, I'm the only person who cannot see what you type in. So I'm hoping that you're doing that now, but I have no way of finding out. So those are the first three ways of interacting. Again, there's the raise hand, there's the ask button, there's the dialog box. And then one of the things that, that really makes Shindig special is that um, you talk to each other and have, we can divide you into, or you can divide into group, talk about questions. So Kevin can pose a question. You can actually talk about that with, with another person and uh, describe what you're doing in your school or what you'd like to do and give feedback on what somebody else would like to do. Uh, normally we have a time where you, you do that right now, uh, but I think that what we're gonna do is skip this exercise for now and um, give you a chance during the session to try this out. And when Kevin wants to do that, I'll, I'll come up and I'll explain how to do that. So we'll point out that next week we have another EdChat Interactive. This is uh, uh, our purpose in next week's is to really get a conversation going. I think there's, you know, we do, but, but we may not realize the effect that politics influence education and it, partially because our schools are public schools, so that they're government bodies, and partially because kids 
uh, understanding what's going on politically is something that kids need to know and, uh, and, and get involved with. So next week, we're going to have a rousing discussion with Dave Henderson and Jeff Madlock, uh, both on how politics affects schools, budgeting, policy, and curriculum, and also on uh, how politics affects kids and how we interest kids in, in discussing politics. So that's next week, March 15th. You obviously know how Threadshed Interactive by going to our website because you're here tonight. And then I would like to introduce Kevin. Uh, as I mentioned, Kevin has written a few books. Uh, two of them are The 20 Time Project, which is what we're primarily talking about tonight. Uh, a second is a code in every class because really coding is, is, has become a quintessential skill for students as they graduate from high school and college. Uh, and then um, I, I just should say that uh, Kevin has uh, taught uh, project-based learning, he teaches digital citizenship, he teaches design, and he uh, calls himself a learning animal. Uh, so let me bring down the slides and let me bring Kevin up. Kevin. Hey. Hey, everybody. How are you? Kevin. Hey. Hey, Mitch. So I see. I'm light. doing great. Thank you uh, so much for for having me here. I'm. <laughs> and. Uh... Is that any better? Uh, that's fine. No, no, no. It was fine. It was just like here. It's eight o'clock at night, but you're in California, so it's five o'clock, and it's still bright. Oh. Oh right, 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 right. right. Yeah, and it's not even uh, daylight savings time yet. But yeah, yeah, we just uh, uh, yeah. it's a beautiful evening here in in California, and uh, thank you so much for having me. So I think what I'm going to do is I will stop my podcast and I'll bring up your slides so you can get started. Okay. Great. Oops, sorry. sorry. Okay, I see thing. my slides are about to get started. I gotta say, I really am excited. To... Oh, that's okay. I'm excited about this medium. This looks really. Uh, it's it's such a cool way to uh, make webinars more interactive. And yeah, I think that having those the participants be able to interact with each other. That's pretty cool. Okay, are we ready to go? Looks like. So as Mitch said, um, I'm a, I'm a teacher. I teach at a at a small school, uh, York School in Monterey, California. I've been there for about uh, 15, 15 years. Yeah, the slides are up. I see them. At least I see them on my end. Um, my my been, I've taught both uh, all the way sixth grade all the way through graduate school, and. Uh, but my most of my experience is in high school. Uh, but I'm also a trustee of a of a small uh, school, the International School of Monterey, which is uh, K through eight. So I've got a pretty broad experience in education. Um, but I will say that uh, a, a lot of these, what, what I'm going to talk to you today, began uh, back when I really started getting more and more interested in technology in the classroom and spending more time um, learning about technology companies and how technology companies have created uh, a culture of innovation that they have and looking for ways to, uh, in, to apply their insights into education. So uh, let's go to the next slide, Mitch. And one of the things that we're noticing, we have a little bit of uh, of a delay. Uh, we'll just pretend it's like uh, CNN, and I'm a remote correspondent. So I, I want to talk about the need for problem solvers. I don't think I need to convince anybody that we've got some serious problems that we need to solve in our country, the United States. But I assume that this is a global conference, and that. Um, that, that got a lot of problems that we need to solve. In fact, 
uh, 15 years ago, when I started at my current school, I had my students read a book. This is in 2002. I had them read this book called Challenge 2020, and it was written by the head of the World Economic Forum, and he, he argued that we had had 20 problems that we needed to solve by the year 2020, um, including poverty, education inequality, climate uh, change, and many, many more of those problems. And uh, well, we're here at 2017, and uh, we're not much closer to solving those problems. In fact, some may argue that we're farther away. I don't care what side of the political spectrum you are. Mitch, I'm, I'm really excited to see the politics of education at your, your next event. Um, but I don't care what's, where you stand politically, I think we all agree that we've got problems that we need to solve. And this became a, a bigger issue for me personally once I started having kids. I have two uh, really young boys, and, and, uh, and I'm, I'm looking at the world that, that I'm going to hand off to them, and you know, I'm, I'm worried about that. So you know, as, as someone who is worried about that, I thought, all right, well, I need to solve all these problems. Well. It didn't take long for me to realize that I wasn't going to be able to solve all of those problems myself. I'm, I'm not a scientist. There's a lot of technical expertise I don't have, and you know we need we need to kind of share share that burden. But one of the things that I do have is I have access to a group of students who are in in my classroom every day that I can uh, help put a dent in these problems. If I, I believe that if I think it, get my students to think of themselves as problem solvers, I think I, I can have my impact on uh, improve, improving our, our state of the world. So let's take, go on to the next slide. So here's a, here's a chart that just came up from that uh, I found my, I have a friend who was at a Google conference Excuse me, and she she posted this up. This is from the Economist, and this outlines the um, the most critical, the the most innovative companies believe they need out of their employees. And if you look at this chart, you'll see um, above all the others, problem solving was at the very top of the this list, and. Uh, and you know this surprised me a little bit because in my TED talk that I gave uh, four years ago, uh, IBM did a similar study, and creativity was at the top of the list. Um, creativity is still very important, but but it seems like problem solving is what uh, what the number one demand is, and that's that's simply because we we face so many difficult problems. So I'd like to talk a little bit about problem solving and and how we as teachers can develop problem solving among our students and we can go to the next slide um, you know I really believe that we can divide problem solving into two different categories um, the first one I want to talk about is algorithmic problem solving so that's a that's a pretty fancy word an algorithm is simply um, a set of instructions that you need to follow to uh, solve certain problems um, these are problems that have already been solved by somebody else, but if we want to accomplish a task, we need to know those algorithms in order to solve those problems. And so these algorithms get handed down to us generation by generation, and, and a lot of our job as teachers is to teach students the algorithms that they need to navigate their world. So, you know, you see up here I've got um, an image that represents the Pythagorean theorem. So if you you know you want a, a height of a tall structure, but you don't want to climb all the way up there, well you could you could actually um, through measuring your distance from that structure and then uh, measure the angle to the top of that structure. You make a right angle and using the Pythagorean theorem. You can solve that problem, and and thanks to that Greek Pythagoras, he solved that problem for us. And as long as we pass down that algorithm, we can solve that problem. You know, you want to find the force of an object. Well, Newton gave us that algorithm: force equals mass times acceleration. Or, or you know, you want to know which there to use in a sentence: t h e i r, t h e y r e, or um, t h e r e. Uh, it's just an algorithm. 
not all of my Facebook friends have figured out that that algorithm of there, there, and there. But uh, hey, it's it's just an algorithm. And uh, let's go to the next slide. And I've got to say that I, I really do believe that uh, we as teachers are are always going to need to teach some algorithms. Although there seems to be a movement and um, a trend away from uh, teaching algorithms, especially in the age of uh, the smartphone and the, the laptop computer and, and Wikipedia, when in, in truth, so many of the answers uh, you know, can be found just by looking them up. And you know, I'm really fond of the phrase that you know, if, if doing a Google search breaks your, your tests, if, if, if you're worried that your students are going to cheat because they have access to Google now, well, then, then maybe there is some uh, reason to rethink the kind of questions that you're asking on your assessments. Although I, I, you know, I, I do strongly believe that in order to function in our system, students do need to have some of these algorithms in their back pocket, ready to go at all times and not have to look them up. So that's my first question that I would pose to the group if we have some activity out there. What are the kinds of algorithms? Or give, can, you, can you state an example of, of an algorithm other than I've already cited that, that you think all students should have memorized? Or, or, and so when I say algorithm, it's, it's simply a set of instructions that allows you to solve a problem. Well, I'll come up with one, you know, and, and I think that, you know, students need to know how to do things like balance a checkbook um, to budget. And to me, those are pretty algorithmic things. Yeah. And maybe not students per se, but by the time they graduate. Those right. And, things. you know, what's interesting about that is those sorts of. It's pretty strange to me that those things aren't always taught in schools. You know, we don't teach all students how to do their taxes or how to, you know, create a family budget. And I think that that's, uh, that's kind of tragic. I, you know, one of our, our math curriculum seems to be directed towards getting to calculus. Um, but I'm really interested in, in this little trend, might not be too popular, but I think it's the right direction instead of uh, all students heading towards calculus. How about all students head toward statistics? And there's a, a great uh, little TED talk on on that as well. But yeah, that's that. I, I'd agree with you 100 percent, Mitch, on that. And then another algorithm. Should we go back to the slides? Oh no, go ahead. Oh sure. I was just going to say another algorithm is that you know students, even though today you, you, there's, there's GPSs, I think students should know how to read a map. And that, that's another algorithmic thing that, that I would say that, that every student should know. I mean, and I'll pull myself down and bring you slides. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, and yeah, let me, let me add, I, I agree. I think that, that, that students need to read a map. And, uh, you know, I just, I just watched this video that I posted on my Facebook page that, anyway, and if anyone wants to friend me on Facebook, I'm Brookhauser on Facebook and, and Twitter. Um, so the students increasingly don't know how to read a map. IKEA is now changing their products because they're finding that the younger people who buy their furniture don't know how to use tools, which I think is very innovative of that uh, you know, students don't know how to use a tool which in its own way is, is an algorithm. Anyway, let's, uh, let's move on to the next slide. So really our job is to teach these algorithms, but I think more, even more important than that, our job is to motivate people to teach, uh, or motivate students to learn these algorithms. So because uh, increasingly, we have to curate the algorithms, but then we also have to inspire students to to learn them. Now, luckily, we've got this really great uh, tool at our, our disposal that um, really does a great job of motivating students to solve algorithmic problems. Uh, Mitch, you can go to the next slide. And this is just a foolproof motivator that's really great at, at teaching algorithmic problem solving, and that's that's bribes. 
we uh, we bribe our students to to solve those problems in the form of uh, carrots and sticks. You know, these grades we we reward students with good grades if they learn how to solve these algorithms, or we threaten them with bad grades if they. Uh, you know, the if we can get parents involved as well. Like I don't know, when I was a kid, if I didn't get a good grade, I got grounded, and so I was really motivated. It's a learn whatever it is the teacher wanted me to learn. And so that that helped me learn those particular algorithms. Um, let's go on to the next slide. So the the other type of problem solving that I want to talk about is heuristic problem solving. So algorithmic problem solving is simply like following a set of instructions. But heuristic problem solving is the kinds of problem not yet been solved. So back when Pythagoras was trying to how one might figure out the, the hypotenuse of a triangle, well, he went heuristic problem solving in order to come up with that, um, with that solution. Or um, who was it? Was it Euripides that that was uh, that was trying to figure out the volume of a of a, a strange object or a volume of a crown and uh, couldn't figure out how to how to measure the volume or how to calculate the volume and then you know he got in the bathtub and saw that the the displacement of the water went up and he oh Archimedes you're right right <laughs> thanks Mitch um, well he he. Archimedes went through uh, problem solving, basically like trial and error and, and brainstorming and just like coming up with, with weird solutions. And, and, and in order to solve those problems that haven't yet been solved before, we, we need to really stretch our brains. We need to do, uh, it's, it's participate in this in what's called divergent thinking and think of brand new solutions and and a lot of times that's through trial and error and there's lots of error and failure that goes on in in heuristic problem solving and trying to solve problems that haven't yet been solved and and you know here's here's my my major pitch is we need students to know what it's like to go through heuristic problem solving if we're going to want a, a population of people who grow up with these problems that have not yet been solved. And that's that's my big push. In order to do that, though, you need to embrace the kinds of experiences that we don't often embrace in school, um, particularly trial and error and um, and uh, and experiencing and, and, and thinking differently and being, being open to off-the-wall possibilities. And... Uh, and and I let's go on to the next slide. Um, and I want to share with you. This is an image of uh, a reservoir in California a couple of years ago, and you can see that the reservoir was depleted. Well, um, the LA County was looking for a solution to try to preserve the water they're experiencing. So they decided to give this this crazy idea a shot. They dumped thousands and thousands of little plastic bottles into the reservoir to try to reduce uh, water loss through evaporation and also to try to um, insulate the water as well and protect it from the elements. And so they did this crazy thing. And you can go on to the next, <coughs> next slide. Um, you know, the, in, in order to, to think of this kind of solution, it requires some pretty out of the box thinking, and and you know no no normal person is going to uh, immediately come to that as a, as a solution, and it requires some level of divergent thinking. So you can go go on to the next slide. Now this solution did not um, that that the balls in LA it worked in some circumstances it didn't work in all circumstances so it was definitely a trial and error sort of, sort of situation but the reason I highlight that is is that you know you we gave it a try um, big problems one of the ones that I share a lot is getting internet access to the to the most remote communities in the world the people who need internet the most well one of the things that they're trying and they don't know if it's going to work 
is by sending helium balloons up into uh, 70,000 feet up in, in the, into the air um, and putting uh, 3G and 4G transceivers up there. And uh, they didn't know if it would work, but, but pretty recently, like a, couple, a month ago, they just released that their, their technology is working even better than they had thought. And they can now direct these balloons to go where they want using predictable weather patterns. It's just, it's amazing what's, what, what they're doing. Now, <clears throat> let's go back to the question of motivation. Um, we talked about how to motivate students to solve algorithmic problems and how bribes work so well in motivating those kinds of problems. Well, here's the bad news. The bribes, and we can go to the next slide. Um, those extrinsic motivators lousy job of motivating the kinds of problem solving that's necessary to solve heurist to solve heuristically. Um, not only do those extrinsic motivators like grades, like carrots and sticks and rewards and and punishments, not only do those um, extrinsic motivators fail to motivate heuristic problem solving or sometimes what I call wicked problem solving, solving those hard really hard hard problems they actually undermine it and there's a there's a great research out there you can go to the next slide um there's the, there's a lot of research that's been done on watching people solve problems that require divergent thinking that require playing with heuristics and i can't recommend this book enough uh the book is called drive by daniel pink and it's really what inspired my um really what i'm i'm going to talk about even further when i when i read this book about five or six years ago i realized that i needed to completely change uh a lot of what i was teaching and what he talks about in this book is is motivation and really motivating the kind of creativity the innovation and most importantly the problem solving skills that our workforce now, this book is, is intended for an audience of business managers, but reading it as a teacher, you know, I, I became committed to um, you realizing that those sorts of extrinsic motivators that managers often use to try to motivate their employees, like uh, bonuses and, and salaries and perks, like they, they do a good job in getting, in, in getting employees to be compliant. But when they want employees to be really creative and innovative, those sorts of extrinsic motivators just don't work. Let's let's jump to the next slide. Um, I, I can't can't recommend this book enough, and I'm going to talk a little further about it. So why don't bribes work for heuristic learning or he heuristic problem solving? Um, do we have anybody, uh, Mitch, that that might be interested in? in discussing this question? So I will say if you'd like to uh, come up and uh, talk about your your thoughts about... Uh, Let me go to the chat and see if anybody's... Um, then uh, click on the raise hand button. Uh, or if you, again, if you move your cursor over your avatar, you'll see that there's an IM button. And if you click on the IM button, then you can just volunteer by text. Now, I know that we have one person here who's using a tablet. Um, and so uh, for that person, if you have something that you want to volunteer, cl click on the Ask button, and then you can uh, type, uh. type in something, and we can address it. But, um, but I'll, I'll, you know, if it, in, the, in the absence of other people participating, um, you know, just you know, my... My guess would be that bribes are um, are good at motivating for short-term behavior, but very often for these uh, these long these hairy mm. uh, you need to you need to be thinking much more long-term, and um, and bribes tend not to work for things that that take long periods of time because um, they wear off. So that would be that would be my my thoughts. Right. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. I think, uh, uh, yeah, the, the bribes don't, uh, they don't have the kind of staying power, right? Yeah, it doesn't, 
it doesn't motivate those kinds of long-term projects. You know, I think of bribes as, as very binary, right? So you get a, a bribe if you accomplish a very concrete task, right? So you, you, you complete this task and you get a, a, a reward. And may, maybe that reward is on a scale. Maybe it's not binary. Maybe there is a spectrum. Like the, the more you accomplish the task, the, the more reward that you get. Um, I think, I think one of the the pitfalls of of these bribes is, is that when you are offered a reward like a bribe and or you know you're you're running away from a threat of some sort, you get really focused. Um, and and I believe like I love focus. I think focus is an asset that's in in very short supply in our society. So I need my students to know how to focus. But, but I think that there's a risk of focusing all the time, especially when you're trying to solve a problem with Nifley, which is how we need to solve um, these problems that we haven't yet solved. I think when you get to, you, you, you get a, t a type of tunnel vision and you can't see opportunities around you. So we can go back to that Archimedes story, right? You know, he was so focused on figuring out the value that crown and you know you can imagine him having a tape measure out try to come up with a, a solution so what did he do he went and had a bath you know and 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 that's when he had that that eureka moment um you know when you're when you're really focused on extrinsic motivator uh you, you know you tend to work so hard and i think you get a little rigid in your thinking and that's what that's what I, I want my students to break free from that. So, so uh, good. Let's let's go back to the slide deck. Yeah, the, I, I would, actually, so I have I have another possible that, that thing that I'd like to bring up also, and that is when we start issuing rewards, we're also encouraging people to figure out how to beat the system or how to cheat. And so Please. we see that time and again, not just with students, but in all aspects of life. That as soon as the rewards <laughs> become meaningful. People spend more time trying to figure out how to get the reward than to do the things that the reward is supposed to be um, encouraging. So I'll leave that that thought also, and then I'll bring up your slides. Right. Oh, that's that's so true. And and in, in a classroom setting, please bring up the slides. But but I just want to keep expand on that. I think you're absolutely right. And in a classroom setting, the way to game the system is to figure out what the teacher wants. Right, which is a recipe for compliance. And fine, I want my students to be compliant on some level, but that's not really the skill I want to get out of my students. Um, okay, let me move around some windows so I can see my uh, see my. Let's go go to the next slide. I think. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so Dan Pink in his book outlines that there's three components that really um, do a good job of evading uh, that kind of divergent thinking, but that problems we want out of our students. Um, and those those three elements, uh, uh, instead of bribes, if we can create a classroom environment where we provide autonomy, mastery, and then on that next slide, it says purpose. If we can create uh, a classroom where students, first, autonomy, where students have more freedom in what they learn and how they're learning it. Um, mastery, I want to talk a little bit about mastery. Mastery is not about uh, an A on an assignment. Mastery is, very specifically, is the recognition over time. So if we can show students that they are better at an academic skill or, or any sort of useful skill, if, they, if we can prove to students that they're better now than they were you know, six weeks ago or two years ago, then we show students that they are developing mastery. And that is intrinsically motivating on a level that sim a simple grade on a paper is not. And then finally, purpose. Uh, show students that the work that they're doing has value outside of the classroom walls, that the goal is not to impress the teacher or please parents, but the goal is to have an impact on something outside of themselves. I think if we create a classroom environment that, that 
allows for some level of autonomy, mastery, and purpose, then we're going to start developing those problem solvers that, that we really want to get out of our students. And really, those, those uh, problem solving skills that will allow our students to be successful. So let's go to the next slide. Um, those skills, by the way, you know, weren't th those those skills that autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Those skills were not um, sought after fifty or even twenty. You know, what what employers wanted was compliance. They wanted workers that would follow instructions. But now we don't need that. We've got robots and we've got computer programs good at following instructions. We need people who know how to create. Uh, new things and solve new problems. So, so Google is one of these companies that absolutely depends upon a, a culture of innovation. And so they've, they've thought very carefully about this. How do they create that culture? So they've implemented systems that allow for autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And one of those systems is 20% time. And 20% time is this interesting thing in Google. Like, it's not. Uh, it's not like when you become a Google a Googler, you, you're you're handed twenty percent time to work on the project you want. But embedded with the culture of Google is the uh, expectation that you would pursue your own interests on top of whatever's on your job description. They really don't want. Google does not want their employees to feel trapped by their job description and they, they really want their employees to, to, to go beyond what just is in their job description. And so if there's a you know if there's a problem or if there's something that just bugs an engineer at Google, at Google, the Googler can take the vast resources that Google has and attempt to solve that problem. And, uh, and that's, that's, those are the kind of employees that Google really wants are those people that are bothered by the status quo and and want to take breakthrough technology to solve a big, you know, a pain point problem that everybody experiences. So, for example, a, a long time ago, which in Google years, admittedly, is like eight years ago, an engineer at Google who was really frustrated by the, by the email experience, you know, really frustrated that you had to delete your emails, you ran out of room, or you couldn't find the emails you were looking for. And so he invented Gmail as a part of his 20% time. So anyway... <coughs> This culture of, of allowing employees to pursue their own interests, um, have that kind of autonomy that, to serve a real purpose and to see that your, your work will allow you to grow as an individual and develop mastery. Well, I was so impressed by Google's um, uh, the system that I said, well, 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 I could just apply that to my class. Let's go to the next slide. So I, I, I went to my class and I said, you know, what we're going to do is uh, – I'm going to give you a certain amount of time every week, like just like one day a week, to work on um, work on your work on a project of your own choosing. Maybe we should go to the next slide unless you see more people, Mitch. Um, oh, you know what? We want to go to Kean. Let's let's go to go to Kean's video. So one of the one of the things that I did was. Uh, Let's get that started up. I want to share with you uh, one of what one of my students when I told him to that he could pursue a project. I love creating writing and telling stories, and for me, telling a story through a video game is combined the best of both worlds. I love creating. I recently wrote a sci-fi storyline named Exodus Justice. Telling a story to make this to bring the story to life, I have used different 3D modeling animation programs such as Autodesk Maya and Autodesk Mudbox as well as using the Unreal Game Engine to actually make my characters playable. I believe that these roles okay, we can games stop this. are a new way to... As well as using the Unreal Game Engine to actually make my characters playable. I believe that these role-playing games are a new way... So, this was Kean talking about the project that he decided to do, do um, because his English teacher at the time said, I'm going to give you a certain amount of time to pursue some independent project. Now. Um, since then, I've really been interested in computer programming and the importance of, of teaching computer programming. And I think it's good to learn computer programming. Um, but I've dabbled in coding myself. And I've realized that really 
any of us could teach a little bit of computer programming, no matter what we're cl what class we're teaching, um, which is why I wrote this book, Code in Every Class, and it's for all teachers who want to give their students a little bit of exposure to computer programming. Um, let me go back to, to my story of, of when I told my students that I, that I encouraged them to pursue a project of their own choosing. I, I have to admit, when I first introduced it, I thought I was going to get hailed as like teacher of the year, and my students are going to love me. And they're like, wow, we can work on our own interests. And the truth is, my students did not embrace that, um, that initial uh, introduction to 20 time. They, they, you know, my, by the time the students had gotten to my class as a 10th grade teacher, my students had had 10 years of schooling that taught them how to get good at education, how to, like Mitch, like you said, game the system. And what I was doing was kind of throwing that system out the window and asking students to come up with their own projects and solve their own problems. And, and so I was kind of tearing up that contract that my students had been so used to by introducing 20 time. But um, I, I went through some interesting, some really cool brainstorming activities and this, this experience that I called a bad idea effect um, to get them to really kind of have fun with their ideas. And uh, even those reluctant students, I said, well, look, you got to do it anyway. You know, I call it mandatory autonomy. And, uh, and so I forced my students to, to work on autonomous project. But, and after a, enough cajoling, um, here's uh, some of the projects that my students are working on this year. So Mitch, can you play that video 20 times? I coded a web page utilizing HTML and CSS to assist people in tracking important medical information. I I'm designing and constructing a 3D HTML interactive display to introduce the exotic animals guests can adopt at the SBCA for the Monterey County. We designed a desktop arcade console that uses a programmable Raspberry Pi computer and monitor to run 80s and 90s retro arcade games in order to allow for young students to play retro games. I am designing a new website for orchestra in the schools, a local nonprofit organization that supports young musicians. I'm building a model glider that employs autopilot to navigate at high altitude to shoot aerial photography or collect weather data. I'm developing a social networking app that aims to bring back the art of human conversation. I am designing a 3D model to help others visualize the York School Library as a learning commons, a transformed space that would reimagine the notion of an effective learning environment. We crafted a sculpture incorporating an Arduino and LEDs to demonstrate how technology can be blended with art. I am designing and making a small speaker that can be attached to a backpack and used to play music while hiking or biking. I'm building an interactive and personalized website to help students better keep track of upcoming classes and cycle days. Inspired by heated clothing, I'm inventing a USB-powered warming headband that treats headaches and provides the ultimate comfort with a single click. With a single click. Okay, I think Mitch uh, muted me. I'm not sure if my voice is back yet, but um, let's go on to the next slide. Yes, oh, thanks, Mitch. So I'm going to skip through a couple more of these slides. I, the next slide, actually, I'll, I'll Quick breeze through because I want to talk about briefly, but um, in the interest of time, uh, you guys remember these books, these choose your own adventure books. These are the only books that I read when I was a kid, um, and this is how I introduced uh, computer programming to my students and how I introduce it to teachers. So, choose your own adventure books. What's so great about them is that you get to the end of chapter one, and then you as the reader, the, all, the, all the books are written in the second person, so it's like, you're traveling through space, or you're in a, you're in a uh, ancient archaeological burial ground, and you get to the end of the chapter, and you have to decide what the character does, and depending on which option you choose, you go to a different page, and then you get this different narrative. 
And uh, it creates a level of interactivity that I loved when I was reading, when I was a young reader in middle school. And, uh, and I loved writing these Choose Your Own Adventure uh, novels. And when I was learning a program on my Apple IIe as a kid, I, I learned how to make these kind of Choose Your Own Adventure experiences in, a, in the form of a computer program. So we can go to, go to the next slide. Um, last year, uh, our history teachers passed around this website that was created by the BBC. It was called The Syrian Journey. And uh, it, the, the BBC asked to, um, was, was trying to get their readers to really feel and really understand what it was like to be a Syrian refugee. Um, they felt like there was a, an empathy gap and that, that simply by writing another article about the plight of Syrian immigrant or Syrian refugees, they didn't feel like they were, they were telling the kind of stories that people experienced by, that their journalists experienced when they were there in, in the field and meeting these individuals. And so what they did is they created basically a choose your own adventure uh, website that, that asked people to take on the role of a Syrian refugee. Well, and, and based upon what decisions you make, do you decide, decide to go over the Mediterranean or do you go through the, through, um, the desert? And you have to make these really difficult choices. And we found as a faculty, when we, this uh, website got passed around, we found that we really had a dramatically different um, impression and we felt more empathy and cared more about the topic. <clears throat> and so uh, for, for one of the 20 time projects, we decided to, and we can go to the next slide, a group of students, many different disciplines decided to create, a, not of Syrian refugees, but something that was a little more applicable to our locality, and that was Central American immigrants coming into California. And so we, we got out a, a big piece of butcher paper and some post-it notes and you know, made this, this branching tree of all the different places a story could go. And this is all research-based. And this is the kind of activity that I think that, that uh, students across a wide degree of grade level, I can imagine third, third graders and second graders you know, building a narrative uh, as, a, as a team, building a narrative that changes based upon decisions that you make. And this can be done with a, with a simple website. You just need to have a, a links that go to different pages that tell those stories. And you can even do it in a, in a Google Doc. And, you know, Mitch, if you invite me back sometime, I'll, I'll do a, if this is something that you're interested, I'll do a, a workshop on how to create this sort of program. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, the, the next slide you'll see is the, the rough draft of the, the page that we're working on. So we'll see that. Let's go on to the, the following slide. I share with all of my students. Um, it's from the book um, "Steal Like an Artist," and uh, I warn my students that they're that if they're going to experience, if they're going to go through a big project like I'm asking them to go through, that they're going to experience the following steps. It's going to start out, "This is the best idea ever," and then, oh, "Okay." It's harder than I thought, and this is going to take some work, and this sucks, and it's boring. And I tell my students, they're going to think their project sucks, and they're going to hate it. And then it's going to get worse. They're going to go through the dark night of the soul. And I even tell my students that if they're in the dark night of the soul, like, raise your hand, tell us, because it's going to get better. Um, it's going to be good enough to finish, because you'll learn something, and finally, it's done, and it sucks, but it's not as bad as I thought. And, you know, I'm sorry about that harsh word, sucks, but it's kind of appropriate. You know, a lot of the work that your students are going to do is going to be, like, not so great. And that's because they're kids. You know, Malcolm Gladwell tells us that, that um, it takes 10,000 hours of practice to get good at anything. And so your kids are young, and so they're going to produce work. And if they have taste, like, if, they're, if they have good taste, they're going to be even more frustrated because they're going to see the work that they produce, and they're not going to be happy with it. But they've got to get through that phase in order to get good at anything. And I think it, it helps to warn the kids that, that that's going to happen. Let's go to the next slide. So let's talk about assessment, right? So I, I, when, when I was 
talking about bribes. That's that's kind of a pejorative grades. Now, I don't, you know, I've got kind of a mixed feeling about grades, but I know uh, my students are really concerned about their grades, and so are the parents. So when I tell my my families that we're going to do this thing called the twenty time project, they want to know like, well, it's so such a big deal. How am I going to be graded on it? And I tell them like, like, don't worry about the grade. It kind of undermines the whole uh, the whole point of this. But the truth is, I do grade components of this assignment. So I I have them draft up a formal proposal, and I grade that as I would any other formal writing assignment. I have my students blog throughout the year, and so I you know, make sure that they blog every week, and so I grade them on whether or not they submitted their blog post. Um, I, I'll talk a little bit about a final presentation that, that I have them do, and I grade them on the final presentation. One thing I don't grade them on is the project itself. So, and, and I do that because I want my students to feel free to take risks and to try to do something that might not work. And and if, if they create this thing at the end of the year and it just, just falls flat and it doesn't work out, um, I definitely don't penalize them for that. I I, I have a, a mantra in my class. Uh, it reads, done is better than perfect. And I, I want my students to know that they have to finish something at the end of the year, but but it doesn't have to be perfect. And uh, and I'm much more interested in, in them taking some risks. So let's go on to the next slide. So I, I really, I mean, I want to conclude by talking about this trend that we experienced um, of moving from teacher to student-centered learning. And, and I think that this is a pretty positive trend. I, I, I'm glad that, that we're focused you know, more on student-centered learning than teacher-centered learning, although I got to admit, I, I love teacher-centered learning. I think I'm pretty good at it. But um, anyway, I, I, I think it's important to have student-centered learning. Um, and uh, and that's why I don't do as much of those standing in front of the room as much as I'd like to. Um, I, I I put a lot of the work on the student, but but my pitch to you all is is really to to take it to another level and also consider audience centered learning and asking students to work on a project that has a real world audience and that's what goes back to that purpose thing so that. You know, the learning that students get a learning experience that's not about impressing the teacher. It's not even about, but it's really about having an impact outside of yourself. And I think when you do that, then you create a real purpose. Now, there's there's a lot of talk about passion projects and, and you know, having students follow their own passions. What I found is that a lot of my students don't have passions and that they don't really know what they want to do with themselves. And that's why I've, 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 actually devalued, I've discounted the notion of passion, and I spent a lot more time focusing on purpose. Like, how do you find an audience to serve? And and I found that once I find my students working on a project that has a real world audience outside of the classroom, then they start to develop the passions, uh, the, the passions that, that you know we hope that all of our students have. Um, I want to address uh, some of the questions that I saw in the form. Uh, the, there are quite a few teachers who said, "What about elementary school?" I've got to say that that uh, I I'm definitely more experience with high school because I'm a high school teacher. But I have seen this work, and I've worked with schools, teachers, and districts at all grade levels, especially elementary and middle school levels. <coughs> I've seen this kind of projects work. In fact. The sum of learning has been tested way more frequently with lower grades, and that's because of the Montessori school movement. I mean, this is really Montessori learning, but adding that audience component. And so that's the only thing that I think is relatively new to those primary grades is like, where, where are we going to find an audience? And there's, a re there's two great audiences for primary school students. And they are on either ends of the age spectrum. So the little, little kids and the oldest of our population. If you can find some way to create something for, for those groups, um, that's really where you're going to be able to create a project that has, has a significant impact. Um, I highly recommend that you find um, 
you know, a senior center or retirement community and try to find a way to produce work for them. Um, the, another question that came up was, well, we've got so much, especially in elementary school, there's so many things that we need to, we have to do already. We're gonna, you're going to make me add another project onto this. Well, my recommendation is that you, you get rid of something that you're already teaching and, and find ways to manufacture your learning goals into these projects. And, you know, no matter what project that you're, they're working on, there's going to be some level of math and writing and study of humanities um, and and uh, of these projects. So I think you can find ways to fit your learning goals into these projects. And what that does is create a level of authenticity to what you're teaching and give it a real purpose. Um, let me, and what I do at the end of the year is I ask my students to celebrate their work by, um, by part of a of an, an an event that we model after the TED conference, and Mitch, can you like show the first minute of um, of that last video, teaching a generation? What is Facebook? And this was in considering the fact that we were teaching a workshop on Facebook, you could say that we were pretty embarrassed. But what is Facebook? Facebook may have been started out as a social media networking site, but if you look at it today, it has become something so much more. As simple as clicking the home button may be, it can stumble quite a few of the members of the older generation. So for our 20% project, we taught 20 senior citizens how to use Facebook at the Carmel Foundation. We honestly did not realize the impact in the, in, and the importance of our project in this community. We really connected with these we people. We honestly did not realize the impact in the, in, and the importance of our project in this community. We really connected with these people. <clears throat> so there you get a taste of what those final presentations can look like. Um, we modeled them after the TED, TED conference. Um, and so I try to make a big deal about it. We, we reserve the theater and, you know, I get the red rug. That red rug is like totally key. It makes my, my students love it. We even applied for a TEDx license, which, um, which we were granted. We're now in our third year of producing uh, a TEDx event uh, that is in that is uh, helped managed by the TED conference. We 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 organize it ourselves, but we we get our that put up on the TEDx website and and anyway, it's really great. I highly recommend it. Um, and uh, and and it's really I mean I found that that my students are getting these things that just blow me away, and and I've had students come back. Um, and tell me the, the kind of impact that that this experience had on them uh, has, uh, has profoundly transformed the direction that they're heading. And, and you know, I don't know if we're going to solve all the world's problems by issuing 20-time projects or audience-centered learning, but I think it's going to put a dent in it, and, and I... Um, and I hope that you'll you'll give it a try and and model the kind of risk taking that we need our students to model as well by by taking a risk and and giving your students a chance to work on something like this. So thank you so much. I'm I'm happy to to address any other questions that might have come up. Yeah, if you have a question, click on the ask button, and then I'll I'll pass the question on to Kevin. Uh, I I did have one question myself, and that is, let's just say I was. A science teacher, or I could have said social studies, but uh, let's just say a science teacher in middle school, and I wanted to do this, but um, let's just say I was a biology teacher. So really, I want the students to to be choosing right. problems. They're going to be teaching them things in biology. How do I nudge them towards biological problems? Right, right. That's a really good question, and and I've got a kind of a, I don't know, lame lame answer. But but when I, when I was an English teacher, what I the way I nudged them towards meeting my English teaching goals was just make reading a big component of it. Um, I'm glad you chose biology because that's a pretty specific field, and not all projects uh, naturally include the kind of biology skills that you would need. And so I think it's perfectly fine to frame it and say, hey, I, I want you to choose topics that involve uh, 
life. And there's no shortage of the kinds of projects that, that would uh, involve some of the skills that are necessary. And so I think it's perfectly fine to when you're a biology teacher or a accounting teacher, tricks that that will definitely have that skill set involved. I actually don't teach English anymore. I teach a class that's focused on technology, and so I limit my students to projects that involve some level of technology. But um, and and so I try to find ways to fit my curricular goals into all of those projects. But I also will steer my students towards certain certain projects as well so the the key is to provide some level of autonomy and, and often more is better but you do you know i think you still need to meet your goals although i've seen math teachers who um don't require math based projects but ask their students uh to you know do math problems in order to achieve their projects so like have take uh market surveys and then analyze that data that sort of thing I guess if you were a social studies teacher, say an American history teacher, you could have people research groups that um, throughout time have had problems and then come up with and their project could be how would you solve that problem for, those, for that group of people. So you're, you're kind of tying it to U.S. history or, or world history. Yep, yep. Um, and I got to tell you my favorite, uh, one project that I, I w had my students go through when I was teaching history was I asked my students to each write a Wikipedia article. Um, so, so Wikipedia has all these like millions of articles out there, but there's still articles that need to be written about various his historic events. And uh, you, what you want to do is ask your students to look for what are called what are red links. Any link that is red points to a page that the Wikipedia community has determined um, needs an article but doesn't yet have an article. And I asked my students to, to write articles for those red links. And it was the single most rigorous experience my students had gone through because of the, the um, entity that those volunteer editors um, have with regard to accuracy and objectivity. Um, and that, that's kind of a narrow project. My, my students loved it because it was, um, it was rigorous, but it was intended for a real audience. They knew that their work was was actually contributing to the body of human knowledge, which is kind of amazing. Uh, that I love that I love that idea. That, I, th I thought that was really cool. I also loved, you know, the, the the chart that you made about the life of a project, where you you get the dark night of the soul. I think I think we've all been through that, and we've we've seen students that uh, have to go through that also. And then the the end place where it's done, um, and it. And it sucks, but it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Yeah. So, um, and, and then um, your your idea about the right. doing doing a session on how do you write these stories um, where um, you could have multiple multiple endings. I think that would make a phenomenal one because I, I, I could see you know how we could yeah. model that during the uh, you know during during the course of the EdChat interactive. And then, of, okay. and then of course, coding. So uh, those are all great topics. I, um, I, I did put on your slide uh, a few minutes yeah. ago. But how well, and, and what that does is on Twitter. Um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, um, and I, Maybe I do spend a lot of time going out and speaking to schools, and uh, if, if you're interested. Yeah. So you know, people want you at their school; they can just contact you. And then, um, I guess, just to to end, if there were what three points do you most want people to take out of tonight? Yeah. Well, it, it really goes back to those those points that uh, Dan Pink uh, outlined provide the motivation for that kind of, the kind of problem solving that we want out of our students. Autonomy. 
give give students more freedom in what they how they get to spend their time. Uh, mastery. Make sure that you dedicate time to show students that they are prove to students that they're getting better at the work that they do. And then finally, purpose. Don't worry about passions. If they're passionate about something, great. But they've got to find an audience. They've got to find a purpose to do something. And and I think if we give students the opportunity to pursue those three elements, where you'll be amazed at the kind of work that they can do. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, and you know, thank you for a great session. Um, thank you for everybody who came. Uh, next time you come, I'd love you to participate a little bit more and uh, and ask questions and and type in the chat room. Um, but I hope that you got a lot out of the session with Kevin. I, I know uh, I know I did. So I, I, I thought this was great. And uh, Kevin will be talking soon, I guess. So good night. Um, I guess it's dinner time for you. Right. Um, and it's wash the dishes time for me. So. Um, so uh, take care, Kevin. <laughs> and this is Mitch Weisberg. I'm signing off for uh, Ed Chat Interactive, and I hope to see you all week. Uh, take care.